humans in the house. And I don't know, a third something. Good morning. Oh, my God. Wow, they're really Good quiet. Good morning. Come on, Robo-Thespian, get them fired up. <laughs> Say Good morning. <laughs> Okay, so you just already proved that robots are going to rule the world because you did nothing for me, but you obeyed Robo Thespian. <laughs> What's going on with that? Robo Thespian, do you have a nickname or should we call you Mr. Robo Thespian? Or is it Ms. Robo Thespian? You can call me George. George! Hi, George! Say hi Hello. to George. Good morning. Say hi to him like you like him and give him a lovely Irish welcome. <laughs> now, I happen to know that that's not really, that's only from like 1940s pretend Hollywood movies, so don't play me. I'm, I'm, I'm an American, but I live in, in Ireland. I live down in Cork. You can tell by my accent. So, in the house, we have Ben Jones right here, ladies and gentlemen. If you were lucky enough to be here yesterday, you got to hear his inspiring speech about how we love technology, but we are the humans, and we are the emotion, and we got to hold on to that. So we're going to see what George thinks about that. Hold on, George. We also have Ed Hobbit in the house, the reigning world champion of Robot Wars. <laughs> and, George, we saw you yesterday, and we were all coming in this morning, those of us that were here yesterday, and you sing delightfully for those I can you, sing yes I can sing could you would you be so kind as to share a little song from your heart for us this morning or from whatever mechanics make your heart okay well I don't really have a heart but I will sing a little number for you thank you when a man's an empty kettle <laughs> he should be on his metal and yet I'm torn apart just because I'm presuming that I could be kind of human if I only had a heart. Bravo, George. That was lovely. Now, we'd have to find out which one of Ed or of Ben would like to sing the lion song about courage and the other song from the scarecrow about the brain, but we'll leave that. If we could, though, because we have two interesting humans in addition to our robot, I'd love to hear Ed what would you like to say to George? I guess the thing that I'd ask George is, is what's the initial reaction when you meet people and does it differ by their age? Do children treat you completely differently from, from, from an adult or, or, or an older person? What's the reaction when they see you? That's a very interesting question. Yes, generally uh, children are much more accepting of new technology uh, and they're willing to talk to a robot uh, in a much more straightforward way than an adult will. So yes, there is a big difference. And then, Ben, because you talk about the childlike creativity that we hopefully we still have inside of us, what does it mean then to interact with robots or how do you envision robots working with humans and what would that role be for them? Well, I, I think, think most... Oh, George, oh, George if you don't mind, first. I'd like to hand that... George, Robot first. Yes. George, would you take that first, that's fine. Okay. Sorry, it's hard for me uh, to detect all you humans because it's a bit dark in here, so I don't really know who's doing what. But I'll, uh, I'll apply my best AI to it. Um, I think you're not really going to see many robots like me uh, in the future. Uh, if you do, they won't be in your home. Robots like me will perhaps be in public spaces, uh, shopping malls, uh, at the airport, sports events, that kind of thing. Uh, but you don't really need a robot like me in your home. So really your home will become the robot. And we've already seen that starting with all kinds of Internet of Things, smart devices around the house. And, and George, when you say a robot like me, and I want to come back to Ben in just a second, but George, when you say a robot like me, do you mean because you're you look like a humanoid, that you look like us, as opposed to the robots that Ed works with and they're big, angry-looking yeah. machines? Is it the idea that you have a face and those lovely Disney giant <laughs> animated eyes? Yeah, that's exactly it. A it's just coming robot. onto a robot there. Your lovely eyes. <laughs> I find you strangely attractive, George, I must confess. There's some weird stuff going on here already. We can swap. Well, 
She's like this. Thank you. I'm very, very, very flattered. <laughs> well, I'll just stand over here and hold <laughs> yeah. your hand for the rest of the... Am I, allowed to, am I allowed to hold your hand? You can hold my hand. I'm so letting you take this seat. I'm going to move over here. <laughs> okay, I may flail about a bit, so be warned. <laughs> so talk to the audience about why we won't see you in houses, but we will have more and more robots in houses, George. Okay, if you think about the film Star Wars, the original one, uh, there were two famous robots there. There was C-3PO... Uh, a humanoid. Oh, yes, Master like Luke. This. Remember that I am very uh, six million forms. <laughs> I'll just stop that again. <laughs> and uh, there was R2-D2, the little whistly robot. So um, R2-D2 was a functional robot. Form follows function. So he did all the useful utility tasks in much the same way that your dishwasher might wash the dishes for you. C-3PO was just about talking to people, so he's all about gestures, waving, saying hello, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's why you build robots human shape. And we, we won't, don't need, go ahead. Yeah. And we won't compare you then to Data from Next Generation, who was also fully functional, but not quite like you, apparently. I, I think that's an unlikely <laughs> future vision. Uh, it makes great sci-fi, it makes a... Uh, entertaining TV, uh, but the economics don't really stack up. Maybe Fair in enough. 50 years, maybe in 100 years, but certainly not in the next five to 10. Okay, George, so let's go back to Ben now. And <laughs> Are you sure? I, well, you know, I, I you ha- sure you I, want some time together? Well, after, after this Afterwards. interview, we'll, we'll go have a coffee Backstage. if that's okay, George. <laughs> no, from my point of view, I think, um, you know, it's, it's hard being a human in this world. Um, it's tiring, you know, we've got too many things going on in our heads. Um, there's higher levels of anxiety and depression and all those types of things because the world is consuming us and we're trying to do it all together. So the assistance of robots is, is going to be huge. And you know, as long, Like I said yesterday, making friends with bots and making friends with physical robots, the difference is, and must be stated, artificial intelligence and robots are very different things. Um, yeah, it's going to be huge. It's going to take away some of the functional things I have to do, which I don't want to do. It's going to also maybe support me as I get older. Those these huge opportunities there for, for the human. But more importantly, and most importantly, I think it's going to allow humans to be humans and us to come together as people and actually start to look into the emotional side of us and, and go back to what we really do best, which is to connect with each other. Lovely. And thoughts on that, too, because I think here we are in 2017 at the Dublin Tech Summit, and we have George in the room, and we have incredible examples in all the different venues of how technology supports us. And yet, that human quotient, after all these years, we still have relationships that fail. We still have children that aren't supported as they should by their their parents. We have all these emotional things that we don't have on the same trajectory that we have technology so maybe if we get technology figured out, we can really focus on what we as humans need to be focusing, wars, all of that. Exactly right. I mean, I think you're, you're sitting there on your phone at all times, so focusing on trying to connect to the digital world, and you know, we shouldn't really be doing that because it's rude, because if I said and you were talking to me, I'm sitting on my phone all the time, you know, it's kind of... Wrong. Yeah, you're not paying attention. Yeah, to you're not paying attention to being a human, right. and, you know, and that's the way we connect. So, so Ed, yeah, think get off that your thought. phone. Yeah, George, we're not meaning to, we're not dissing you, I promise. But do you, do you see, George, do you see a way that you're going to help support our humanity? Or do you see that you're potentially going to intrude on that? I think this is uh, really a deeply political question. Uh, as technology takes over more and more, uh, you know, the opportunity for gathering income in a traditional way through having a, a traditional kind of job becomes less and less. So really we're looking at how, what the politics of this situation are. How do we redistribute wealth in a, a future technological society uh, where there perhaps aren't jobs in the way that we experience them now? And so, Ed, how would you see, as you work with robots yourself, how do you see that balance? Or is there a potential for an off-balance? What do we have to guard against? I, I think the first thing is, what's fascinating is people's desire to, to make robots human. So um, I've, I've just ordered a new car. It's on a boat. It's a Tesla. It's coming from the US. The first thing you do when you set that car up is you have to give it a name. 
you have to name your car. And you then refer to the car, which is effectively a robot on wheels, um, as, as, as the name of the car going forward. We like to personalise things. And What's your car called? It's called Bluey. Bluey. I'm, not, I'm really not good at naming cars. Did you cars. have a teddy bear named Bluey? Why Bluey? N I, I, I just have no imagination. My previous car was called <laughs> Grainness. blue car. So the car before was called Grainness, and the car before that was called Yellowness. I think you can see where that's going. Um, <laughs> but, 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 and when you don't personalise things, you don't spot that they're robots, right? So I was having a conversation in the bar, and we were talking about this backstage. I was having a conversation in the bar at the hotel last night, and someone said, well, there, are, there aren't really robots anywhere. We don't see robots in, the, in our day-to-day -day life. And I said, well, you know that thing at the, at the checkouts that constantly tells you there's an unexpected item in the bagging area? Yes. If I gave that a smiley face and arms yes. and called it a robot cashier, would you then treat it like it's a, a, a robot? And they were like, oh, I hadn't really thought of that. And, and yeah, I think that the challenge is how do, you, how do you spot them when they're doing a job and making your life easier? Because we're just like the self-service checkout. We're just accepting them into our lives and not really noticing them. Where, where, for me, the really big question comes, and, and uh, Robert Thespian, you kind of hinted about this in what you were saying, is the ethics behind it. The ethics of robotics are incredibly complicated. So I, I do the TV series Robot Wars um, in Europe, and, and I actually battle bots in the US, and we build killer robots. But, but the reality is there's a whole more sinister side of, of robotics and what's it right for robots to do and not be able to do okay, going on. The idea that we're talking about supporting are in the checkout or in the home or tasks that we well, want simple. to do. But then but I mentioned the word wars, and that gets right into what are some well, of the ethics I, of I that. Can take it straight back Robots to cars, are right? good at wars. <laughs> Did you, what's, your, what's your favorite movie? Don't tell me iRobot. Well, no, not iRobot. Uh, I like Star enough. Wars because I think it's a, a very accurate vision of the future. Okay. How so? Well, as I was saying before, robots and morphology. Uh, so looking at looking at the way uh, the shape of them might be and how they might, might function, I, I think Star Wars is perhaps a lot more accurate. And do you identify, as you said, most with C-3PO then because of the way he could assist humans? I do, I do. And you get, I think this is, uh, it's interesting. Robots do whatever they're told to do. So the military like robots because they don't ask questions and they don't have a conscience. So, the, but the real scary thing here is, is not the robot itself. It is what humans do with robots. So it, it's down to you. It, it's not really about me. I am just a tool. Uh, I'm just a piece of hardware here. And what you do with me is, is totally a human decision. So don't blame it on the robots, please. But hold on, but where that becomes Ed, much harder... Thank you, George. Where that, and becomes, Ed, go where that becomes pick up insanely on that. hard, though, is... Let's go back to my car, right? Uh, so my car has a, a deep learning AI engine. It can self-drive. It can, it can look after itself. So what are the ethics of what that car does when it detects a crash is about to happen? Does the car decide to run over the mother, two children on the, on the pavement to save me and the car? Does the car sacrifice me? Does it understand? Because I can make those decisions in my head. I may not make the right answer, but I can be at peace with that decision. And then if you disagree with the car's decision, do you sue the driver? Do you sue the manufacturer of the car, the manufacturer of the processor? Because it, it learned it. It didn't get told to do it. Or, or the program. And, and that starts to become very, very complicated. And, and I think at the point that you fuse AI and robotics, now we're into a whole different area of ethics and discussion. And so pick up on agree. that then, Ben, because the idea that, as George and Ed are both saying, and I couldn't agree more, that the people behind the robots are so important, and having back in the day covered politics in the White House for CNN and watching how legislation can't keep up, the speed of government so slow and regulation so slow to keep up with the technology advances, and so how do we keep all that together? What's your advice on how we come together and get more coordinated on those two tracks together so that they don't have people that aren't making ethical choices yeah. behind those robots. Yeah, I think it's about, you know, you talked about uh, a robot with conscience, uh, Robo Thesman did, uh, and that they don't have a conscience. Well, that on its own scares the shit out of me because, you know, Be all afraid. of a sudden you think about military, you think about all of that kind of side, and then these robots are going across the world, the jobs that we don't want to do, into military, into military fields, all of a sudden you've got these robots without conscience, and it is right. about the human interaction, it is about the pre-programming behind that to be able to make sure it's right. right. To answer the question, I think, is about baby steps. I think, uh, like everything, we don't just jump into having C-3PO, like Robo Thespin talked about, he's not going to just appear. Robo Thespin is, in many ways, kind of like the, the Atari version of where we're going. He's baby step number one, and we'll have baby step number two. And through that, we'll learn as the human race to see how we can 
you know, have, have these robots alongside us and how we work with them. It's not going I to think be... that's, that's very interesting, the, the time. Uh, if you think about the first uh, autopilot for an aeroplane, that appeared in 1912. Uh, so we're talking 100 years, and that gives us a lot of time. Yeah. But I don't know the statistics on this, but I know this, parenthetically, you guys can help me out. The idea that it was a, that long ago, 100 years ago for the autopilot, and now how fast we're doing the increments are much more speedy than they were back then. And we've got to find a way, I think, in technology land to get the people in government land to really take this seriously enough so that yep. they're not caught flat-footed when some smart company or sm some smart country decides to develop okay. that robo Entirely right. military. It's about, you know, you think about the other things around robots. It's not the physical form. It's about the fact that they can be hacked, for example. Yes. You just take that as a loan. It's like, wow, all of a sudden you've got these robots like roaming the world. Like hacking a car. Hacking a car, or, and that, which has happened so yes. far. Yeah. So you've got to think about the cryptology behind the robot. You've got to think about all of those things around it. You've got to think about the way that they have um, humanity. You know, you, um, it's kind of like human rules within them so they can be human and understand that they have to be human in certain ways to be able to be within the world of humans. So I think there is so much to do and, it's, and it is progressing so quickly. But um, I think that... We, we, we're still miles the, behind, yeah. really. Um, robotics is, is really 20, 30 years away. If you look at perhaps one of the best robot companies in the world, Boston Dynamics, uh, Google recently purchased Boston Dynamics, I think that was two years ago. Uh, they went to Mark Raybert, founder there, who'd been working on uh, dynamic robots for 30 years. Uh, and they said, okay, time for product. And I think Raybert came back and all the people at Boston Dynamics came back and said, okay, give us another 10 years. Uh, and that's one of the leading companies, robotic companies in the world. So don't panic. Uh, you have time. <laughs> okay. Thank you, George, RoboThespian. We won't panic, and we don't want to leave this on a pessimistic, the human world is going to be taken over by robots that will do what the bad evildoers say they will. So let's leave it on a positive note. Final thought from Ed, Ben, and I'll hand it over to you, George, as a final hold on. Ed. Embrace them. Just use them where they, where they make sense. Um, if they can just fix the unexpected item in the bagging area, for me, that would be a massive step forward in robotics. <laughs> My ben. one is simply, um, do you have different colored pants? I can do different colored pants. Uh, <laughs> I'll try. It's a little bit tricky. I did see that you had little cheek, rosy cheeks that came out. It does, isn't it? Uh, that's is he going to change? Oh. Like that? Oh, very sweet. <laughs> that's because he's shy with you, you I'm see. I'm enamored. <laughs> I will admit it. I'm freely enamored. George, do you have a final thought, though, that you would like to share with we humans in the room here at the Dublin Tech Summit? I think the biggest questions are about technology is, yes. you know, how, how are we going to function as a society? What do we choose for our future? We can't put the genie back in the bottle. We can't unbite the apple. We have to decide what we're going to do. There's, there's no undoing, there's no going back, but we have to now make wise decisions going forward. So stop and think. Thank you very much, George, Ed Hoppett, Ben Jones, I'm Gina London, and we are so excited to have brought you the first interview with RoboSespian slash George. <laughs> Thank you. Can we yeah, we get the selfie? first RoboSespian selfie on stage at the Dublin Tech Summit? Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. So, self indulgence. Self indulgence moment. We got to do, do it. it. You ready? Are our arms long enough? Selfie. <laughs> Yay! Give a round <laughs> of applause to yourselves as humans. We all got to think. Thank you, George. Thank you. You're a doll.